I'm here to tell you about Creative Spirit and 30 years of service in the community, you know, it's a lot. We even did a show for the senior citizens yesterday. Uh, for 15 years, we've been going up to the VA. We can do a show for them next month. For two years, I volunteered for the Vietnam veterans down at the airport. Um, we did a lot of things. We have children that come through creative spirits and reach higher heights, but it's not what we do. It's the people that is a part of creative spirits. It's what makes creative spirits who we are. And I'm glad that he has come to Atlantis because we need intelligence. Not only is he intelligent, he's bad too because some of the uh, fights that he went up, he got to be bad. And a man in the hood that run the drives put him down too. But we won't let him. That's right. So I am honored. I am very honored that a Mr. Paul Bird Grant would come out in my behalf. I really feel worthy of something to know that you're here. And I really thank you so much. So I can see a little bit of this and a little bit of that. But he has something to tell you. He's going to experience an education. So let him grace you. This is what we came out to hear. Mr. Paul Berger. I'm the president of each and every one of you came out on this night to hear me speak. I grew up in very modest beginnings. I never had a silver spoon in my mouth. I grew up in a boys' home in Brooklyn, New York, at the Stuyvesant of St. John's Home for Boys. The judges said that I was incorrigible. The police said I'd end up in state prison by the time I was 16 or 17. When I was 17 years old, I enlisted in the United States Army. I served as an infantry officer, ended up going to the 75th Rangers, served in a Ranger unit for four years. At the start at that time, there was such a disparate treatment between the rich and the poor, between people that had parents and had people to guide them, and individuals that actually grew up on the streets and grew up with other kids in the society where essentially the streets are normal, where the only way you can actually make it is being part of a group or a gang. I decided when I went to the military that I was gonna to try to change my life, see the world and become a productive citizen, and that's what the military did for me. Once I got out of the army as an enlisted person, I could see the difference in the way people are treated from officers to enlisted individuals, from people with parents, from people without parents, from people that grew up on the streets to individuals that had silver spoons in their mouths, had education paid for, had jobs waiting at daddy's firm when they got out of businesses waiting for them. There was such a big difference in the way you're treated and the way people look at you. I wanted to be one of those people that could help other individuals that come up from the bottom with absolutely nothing in their hands except their own fight. When I take a case, and you can't treat everybody the same way, but obviously I try to be completely colorblind because that's the way I grew up. I grew up essentially a, a white kid with a lot of blacks, and I was essentially one of the only white kids in the St. John's Boys for Home. There was 200 boys there at the time. So when I grew up in a very, very integrated society, and I saw the disparate treatment of individuals, I saw the way some people are treated. So when I take a case now, I really put into my heart and into my mind that I'm going to treat every single person like they're my own child, like they're my own brother, and I'm going to pour my heart into every case. Whether it's the simplest possession of marijuana in municipal court or to a murder trial. I worked my way up, ended up going to college on an army scholarship, came out of the military and actually went back in as an officer again. When you're an officer and you see the way officers treat individuals that come up from the streets and listed people, it's a totally different system, a totally disparate belief in the minds of how people deserve to be treated. And I never felt that way because I always felt that everybody, whether you come up from the rich or come up from the poor, when you come up from the streets or when you're well educated, you know, everybody bleeds the same blood. Everybody puts their pants on one leg at a time, and everybody deserves to be treated the exact same way, no matter where you come from or who you align with. And that's the way I live my life, and that's the philosophy I try to run my practice with. But in any event, I ended up serving on active duty again as an officer, stayed in the reserves in the JAG Corps for 20 years. 
I take cases overseas because I know these soldiers, they're enlisted men, and there's cases that I've taken, the cases in Abu Ghraib in Iraq, I made five trips to Iraq, the case of Sergeant James Parker, a minority member of the tank command, he was charged with criminal negligent homicide because the officers had to blame somebody for a friendly fire of death when the kid was nothing but a hero, father of six children. And now the case I took on now from the 101st Airborne Division, a kid from South Bunker, South Carolina by the name of Corey Claggett. 101st Airborne Division has been in the Army since he's 18 years old. His mother is 100% disabled in a wheelchair. His father fled when he was an infant. He's been in combat 50 tourists of combat, 50 combat missions in the year and a half he's been in Iraq, and now they charge him with double murder. They put him in a cage, eight by eight, chained up 23 out of 24 hours a day, and they're accusing him of a homicide when the rule of engagement was to attack an island where there are Al Qaeda and to engage and kill every member of the mili every member of the military age that he comes in contact with on that island. And when I heard that. And I spoke to his mother pleading with me, and I read the email that the mother sent, and I saw that the fact that the military appointed her a lawyer, a captain in the United States Army Trial Defense Service, a JAG Corps officer, a very nice girl, very nice person, but she hadn't tried one case her entire career. Her name is Sasha Rudica. She had never been to court, had never been to trial. The prosecution team consisted of three very experienced prosecutors who had hundreds of trials. They appointed the defense team was one person who just came into the Judge Advocate General's Court, just graduated from law school, and never had a trial. When I see injustices like that, when I see disparities like that, the money didn't mean anything. I spent thousands of dollars traveling to Iraq to defend this kid, and now we have the court-martial at Fort Campbell, the home of the 101st Airborne Division.